Welcome back, everybody. This is Night Flight. I'm Judith Quoba, and today Ilana Freeland is back. Ilana Freeland is a public speaker, an author. She has written a lot of books, and the last one is in its final stages. The last chapter is getting touch ups. And um, she also is a storyteller, a ghostwriter, a researcher, and she is probably very famous for her books about geoengineering and um, all the problems that go along with that. So, Elana, welcome back. Thanks, Judith. It seems like it's been, I don't know, has it been a year? No, it was uh, late spring. Okay. Yeah, last year. And, um, but you know, I, I knew that you were writing and then I'm a little bit cautious with interview requests because it's, it's quite an undertaking writing a book. Oh yes, I've turned many interviews down just, just because I, I, I just can't, uh, I can't speak until the baby is sort of close to being out in a way. Mm -hmm. I, when I write a book, it's, it's not like I'm writing everything I know. It, it's more like I know a few things and I'm following those threads and then I'm writing as I go. And then I'm making discoveries. That's, that's really how you have to write when you're writing about um, national security issues like geoengineering because most of geoengineering is classified. Mm -hmm. And people don't realize this. They think because they see the word in the newspaper about solar radiation management or something like that, the latest Bill Gates uh, investment in it, uh, they think that it's open uh, source, but it's not. And so uh, you have to just go bit by bit, bit by bit, and you begin to see the lay of the land, and then you make, uh, if you're really paying attention, you make some very interesting discoveries, which for me with this last book is how it went, because I'm late. I, I should have had this book out a few months ago, but because of the lockdown and the fact that it was the entire COVID-19 thing has been about synthetic biology, at least on the biological side, not the political side. Mm. The biological side, that was, this has just been an, a golden opportunity for me to hear from many, many doctors, many, many uh, researchers at universities to read a lot of patent, patents, a lot of papers. And so um, I, I took my time because there was, of course, a mystery involved in this, and I had to be a bit cautious as I felt my way through. Plus, I had a biology background many years ago in undergraduate work. Uh, my second major was biology, um, but uh, the biology now has changed so drastically because they're moving molecular biology, which is what I studied, uh, it, to digital biology. And that's an entirely other creature. And they're also moving from an actual, uh, actual virus or viral uh, way of looking at disease uh, to synthetic viral diseases, which means they're man-made. Mm. So, you know, all of this is, uh, can be confusing even even for trained biologists, which, which I'm really not. I just had my training and could have gone further and didn't. So um, it's been really exciting and a lot of hard work. I, I think this is the hardest book I've ever written because there are so many elements in it. But just to give your listeners a little clarity on that, I have written two previous books on geoengineering. The first one was in 2014, Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. And in that one, I go deeply into what the CIA uh, like to brandish its sword of uh, conspiracy theory, chemtrails, et cetera, when, and actually the term chemtrails comes straight from the US Air Force Academy chemistry manual um, so I went from there to just show 
basically what's being smeared across our skies in military and passenger jets. And I, I posited a few things that I thought it was being used for because I didn't think it was just pollution. I thought it was intentional. There were things being laid in the stratosphere that would come down and we would breathe them in. It would go into our water supply. They would go into our soil for our growing food. Uh, I, I also noticed that Monsanto at that point had created a, uh, an aluminum resistant seed uh, that we call terminator seed because you have to buy it every year. You can't just grow seed from seed. And uh, I realized that at that point that Monsanto was involved in the chemtrails geoengineering going on because someone had told it to make an aluminum resistant seed because they were gonna just douse us in aluminum. And that is exactly what they've done. Mm -hmm. So uh, that book, I mentioned Morgellons in there last chapter, spent the whole chapter on the work of independent scientist Clifford Carnicum uh, so that people could understand that this is a nanotechnology, nano meaning one billionth of a meter Morgellons is, is, was purposely laid. There's no question about it. It's sort of half biological and half inorganic. And, uh, and it creates inside of us, it creates a network, actually. It uh, is uh, self-replicating and it's uh, mimetic. Uh, it mimics our blood vessels, our nerves, our veins, et cetera so that it can create its own network that sort of lies tangential to the other, to the natural. And it is very electromagnetically sensitive. So, so a, a network was laid in us years ago for the last two, over two decades. We have had at least the, at least the first part of that 10 or 15 years was Morgellons being laid into our system for what is now beginning to come, as we saw with the COVID-19. And so the second book, I realized enough in the first book, and then I attracted the attention of a, a guy who had worked for the CIA in geoengineering for his entire life, Billy Hayes, known as the Harp Man. And the Harp Man led me through to show me what else they had in mind besides the chemical trails and showed me that Lockheed Martin was very engaged in resurrecting the space fence, which had been part of the SDI program, Strategic Defense Initiative, back in the Reagan, mm -hmm. George H.W. Bush, Dick Cheney years of the 80s. The winter Bush now years. Say it again. <laughs> the winter Bush years. <laughs> yes. Now, now they were bringing it back because they had had such success with HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project up in Alaska, in controlling the ionosphere. And they were bringing ions down into our atmosphere and uh, making our atmosphere into an antenna or a battery. And that was what they needed for all the wireless operations that they had in mind. So then we got our, we got our computers from uh, the military, we got our cell phones from the military, and now the whole world has turned into a huge wireless space fence lockdown is what I called it in the second book. That title was Under an Ionized Sky from Chemtrails to Space Fence Lockdown. Out of that book, I departed from Billy. I, I laid out the mechanical infrastructure of how the entire world has been weaponized through the environment. And it was through that and then realizing what Morgellons was, realizing more deeply what nanotechnology was, that I decided to write the third and last book in a sort of trilogy that if you wanted to know how the environment is being used against us to control us, uh, you would read, you would have all three phases of my, uh, my discovery 
Uh, and the last book's title is Geoengineered Transhumanism, How the Environment Has Been Weaponized by Chemicals, Electromagnetics, and Nanotechnology for Synthetic Biology. And that's the book that I'm now finishing. I've spent two years on it and it will be out this spring. I'm bringing it out myself. I've left my publisher because I really wasn't making enough money. And, um, and now I'm going to do this one myself. So a little more time consuming, but uh, this is my last book on this topic. I, I, I'm serious. I'm not mm -hmm. going to write another one. I think I will have given my best shot to show what geoengineering really is. It's not just about the weather. It's mm -hmm. not a, about carbons at all. It's not about climate change at all. These, these geoengineers are the climate changers and all of that that we were told before was told to us as a cover story, much like the cover stories that we're experiencing now regarding this latest drama. So, um, so that gives you the overview and then we can go from there. I think I think I got the overview right. Yeah, you have it right. <laughs> so did I hear that uh, correctly? That now I have to be very very cautious uh, how I put this because I'm one peep away from having my channel deleted. Oh yes, you must do whatever you need, and if you know you can cut me off or anything, <laughs> Judith. No, 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 no. It's okay. So um, <clears throat> you know what. There is a life after YouTube. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of radio people who interview me are now putting it up on other things. Yeah, I know. And then they try it on the YouTube. And if it goes down on YouTube, they don't care because they're already up on these other things. Yeah, yeah. So um did I understand correctly that there is a direct connection between um, nanotechnology, geoengineering, and the big C? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. In fact, I knew that early on, I guess it was last a year ago, January, when we began to see the footage of Wuhan. As soon as I saw where they are shaking and then dropping. Mm -hmm. And then when they dropped, as soon as I saw that, I had it. Mm -hmm. 5G. Mm -hmm. It's a 5G environment. I knew it because three months before that, maybe not even that long, Elon Musk had launched quite a few of the satellites that are going up for 5G uh, in order to, you know, make the whole world uh, transmissionable. <laughs> and um, I don't know, I, 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 I immediately got it. And I, by then I was of course writing and I had just finished sections that I had notes from back when AIDS was brought out in the eighties. I, I remember even then, this is what a researcher I am. I, I was still a Waldorf teacher at that time, but I was reading um, a, a news account of AIDS and saw the World Health Organization in the article and started reading a little more carefully. And that's when I realized that the World Health Organization had actually created AIDS and had loosed it. Uh, in very uh, in very pre-chosen populations, you might say, mm -hmm. and that was that was really my that was my first experience. The second experience was a I received a native a document from a Native American in Alaska, talking about the uh, the uh, not HIV but the uh, hepatitis. A uh, of what was going or hepatitis B, what was going on up in Alaska very quietly. Mm -hmm. And then I read the her account of that. And that's this my second aha 
uh, regarding the coming, the advent of synthetic biology, basically, uh, because the the HIV, uh, no, the uh, uh, hepatitis B was a type of a little piece of DNA that uh, we can recognize from being one of the ingredients of the present uh, vaccine that is so contentious. Uh, and um, that, that, that has to do with how I feel that this vaccine in particular, not only is it not a real vaccine. It's a device, yeah. It's, it's very much mm -hmm. a, uh, a software device. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it will be able to do all sorts of things, but along with it in the construct of the vaccine itself, the, the way it's coming in, uh, are many, many tiny ingredients. And there's where you see the devil in the details is to understand what these do. And one of the details of the devil is um, the HIV will be in it. And, uh, and possibly even Hep B, uh, I mean, very possible because this is a grand experiment going on all around the world. And the, of course, the most surprising element people must be noticing is how readily everyone has taken it up. And that itself is part of the story of the prep, the very careful decades long preparation for this event. This was, this did not happen overnight. This did not just take uh, Wuhan, et cetera, by surprise by any means. No, it was uh, very carefully constructed because uh, this, is, this is the grand experiment of all kinds of combinations of this one vaccine to see what happens. And uh, the fact that people have been sort of have been quite mind controlled regarding this is is really also a matter of preparation of years and years of television watching and uh, and iPhones and uh, electromagnetism all around us. Uh, uh, all of this has to do with readying us to be pulsed with, in, in my opinion, to be pulsed with frequencies that have to do with doing what you're told, obedience and uh, an immediate belief. Uh, a lot of, I'd love to do a survey, which of course I cannot do, but to do a survey of all the people who, who have drunk the Kool-Aid as we say in America mm -hmm. uh, regarding this, my guess is they all still own a television. Oh yes, of course, they stream it 24 seven. Yes, and I have, I've never owned a television, I'm proud to say, nor do I own an iPhone or a cell phone. Uh, there are weapon systems from the uh, American military and uh, the military has all the specifications and frequencies that you and I will never even, uh, never see. So uh, I, don't, I don't really trust the technology, just as Martin Marshall McLuhan, the great social commentator of my generation, told us years and years ago that I heard loud and clear, the medium is the message, not the content of the medium, but the medium itself is the message. And that's how I feel about the television. I know it has tremendous subliminal uh, technology in it beyond belief. I mean, you know, I've, I've got it in this next book. I've got it a little... A, a little uh, definition of how it works. And, uh, and then the cell phone, of course, is easy because you begin to pulse and resonate. Problem is we're resonant beings. And so when you're pulsed with, say you're pulsed with a frequency for complacency, that, oh, well, all political leaders are dishonest. So what's the use? I won't do anything. When you're pulsed with the frequency for complacency, um, you begin to resonate to that frequency, even though it's coming from outside your body. And that's the problem with this electromagnetic world is where we've all lost, in a way, lost touch with ourselves because we're too busy picking up 
the uh, frequencies around us and resonating to them. We can't, we can't stop our body and our brain from doing that. That's, that's, uh, that's our beauty, our resonance. Uh, the resonance is from the Schumann uh, resonance of uh, 7.83 Hertz, but it is being manipulated now by the geoengineers and uh, we can't depend on it now. And, and so our brain is going every which way. We may even have thoughts that we don't recognize as our own that we would never think that. Why have I thought that? All of this has to do with the fact that we live in a wireless world now in which uh, some not very good people, and I assume they're still people, they have two arms, two legs, a head, et cetera, but many of them may have a vacuum inside their, their soul, uh, which they have, a, they, where they have abandoned their humanity. And in that case, there may actually be the entry of entities that uh, very much like uh, to live off of human light and uh, munch away at us. Uh, and uh, and I, I really don't know. I, I can't, you know, I can't prove that, but I certainly can prove how this technology works together. And what I'm basically saying with these three books is yes, the same people at NASA and the NSA was involved in it then and uh, Raytheon Corporation was involved, Lockheed Martin Corporation, L, you know, all the big defense corporate uh, guys were involved in uh, HARP. And then it goes on to the space fence, the resurrection of the space fence. And then now here we are in bringing in a medical uh, tyranny through our own biology and what's being uh, implemented in us through these years of geoengineering, whereby things were loosed in the upper atmosphere and we took them in and they were purposely engineered, genetically engineered to interface with our biological system. At the same time, they were uh, readied and prepared for what is known as brain computer interface, BCI. And, uh, and that's really what this is all about, is, uh, is this, uh, this, this relationship we're having with a, uh, an AI, artificial intelligence world, run world, uh, with all of its gugas, all of its, uh, its mechanisms around us, and, and we, we don't know it. We don't know that we now have the actual hardware it's on a nano scale, yes, it's tiny, but it is hardware. And uh, it's, it's in us, it's in every one of us, everyone who breathes, uh, because the earth is enveloped in one atmosphere really, doesn't matter who loosed it. I mean, I'm sure all the nations uh, know about this, I'm sure of it. Uh, and some of them have been attempting to prepare to, uh, to combat it or, uh, or utilize it for their own defense. And I wish them well, because uh, this is just the beginning. <laughs> this is just the setup. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so uh, it's, it, it, I, maybe I'm missing something, but the only way I can imagine that we can confront this is by learning more and more about it no matter how it, if it feels bad, I don't care if it feels bad. I, I mean, I'm not here to sit around and feel good. And if you have that idea of, uh, you know, what your democracy should be, that you should be able to do what you want and that's your idea of freedom and, and nobody should interfere with you and all, that's all very adolescent to me. That's not how things work here at all. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we all have to pitch in and what we're seeing now is how many people living in democratic uh, types of societies have not pitched in. And now we're, we're in a huge problem. And, you know, it was inevitable. I knew it was inevitable, even though I kept railing for, you know, I've been waiting for this moment for five decades. Mm -hmm. I knew it would come because you can't let things go like, you know, your sitting president is murdered in front of you uh, and on television, and then nobody serves a day in jail. You just let it go. Nobody can, no, nobody can do three assassinations 
and then nobody serves a day in jail other than the patsy, of course. Uh, and then uh, nothing is done about it. it. This is inevitable. You can't, you can't pretend like things aren't happening. And so now we're, we're in a real mess. But at the same time, I have to say that what's really uh, encouraging is so many people are waking up, Judith. So many people are waking up. They're contacting me. I'm seeing them in, in uh, you know, in little videos, reading their, their essays. Uh, I guess with most human beings, it just has to get really bad yeah. in order to pay any attention whatsoever to what's going on. And maybe that's the way we'll always be. I hope not. Well, we could do a lot more productive things if we didn't have to go through this over and over again. Um, but uh, at the same time, you, you now see where you can learn so much. Yeah, it's not a matter of surfing the internet, uh, you know, and, and, and having cool video games and cool movies and all that stuff. It's learning, learning our condition and learning uh, about how this technology that we so love, we love what it brings us anyway, uh, learning what some of the uh, other side of it is and how it can be used and exploited for power and gain. Uh, so to me, it, you know, it's a curse and a blessing what this whole thing has been. Uh, and I, I don't know where we will end up, uh, but me, I, I learned years ago to just live day by day. As uh, you know, the spe one speaker of my generation said, Ramdas, be here now. And uh, I pretty much follow that, uh, subscribe to that philosophy. I don't sit around and think about yesterday or tomorrow that much, but I, I very much want to give people the option to really read something where they can learn real facts, they don't have to play the game of the mainstream media, which lies to us consistently and is owned by corporations and run by the CIA. Uh, we can actually um, uh, read something, count on what that author thought was true, did their best to uh, give lots of references for it to be checked and, uh, and that they can then go from there and, and perhaps produce something even better and more insightful. That's my hope, that's my hope. Hmm. So why this obsession to control everything here? Um, I mean, from a psychological point of view, to me, that is totally psychopathic. It is, it is yeah. psychopathic. Mm. It absolutely is. I don't know if you've ever lived in a commune. <laughs> I lived in a few communes in the sixties. Uh, we, it was one of our ideals to live together on the land. Everybody works, you know, you live simply, eat, eat wonderful food from the garden, that sort of thing. And, um, and I lived in five communes uh, over those years. And it's really hard to work things out when you don't have a hierarchy. Uh, when you're a truly democratic uh, little organization like a commune, uh, usually what happens is one personality, a dominating personality will sort of edge his, usually him, uh, way in and uh, start running everything, start telling people what to do. And then there's a, a, you know, some sort of revolution and people don't like that. And then people go take their marbles and go off to play somewhere else uh, and all sorts of things. A lot of drama, a lot of drama. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's much easier to have a benign dictator. It's much easier. Mm -hmm. Just do what they say. And then if you don't like what they say, then, uh, then you get someone else. And um, that's kind of what we're seeing now. We're kind of in between the way we've always been where we've always had a hierarchy and uh, we've made peace with it so that, uh, you know, and then we, then we established elections where we could elect a new leader and, you know, and then do what that leader said. And, and then now we have an entire, uh, anarchist movement going on where, you know, supposedly we're not going to need anyone. 
Well, unfortunately, that's not really true yet. We're not developed enough to be able to self-rule. To, to, for me to be able to control myself would be the first step to a truly um, egalitarian, non-hierarchic uh, setup. And in the world, that's kind of how we are. So what we have now is a sort of battle going on between the globalists and, uh, and who have always wanted to run the entire earth and, and then the different little nation states because we haven't had nation states that long. I mean, people might think we've had them thousands of years, not so. We haven't had them that long. We've had like the Austro-Hungarian empire. We've had empires and we had the Austro-Hungarian empire until World War I. So, uh, so it's, it's a little complex, uh, the ruling, because if we were able to truly rule ourselves, well, then we wouldn't need these governments. We wouldn't need to deal with power mongers like the global elites and, and the, the, new, the new kid on the block, the corporations. Mm. I mean, these massive corporations where everyone's Teflon, you can't, you know, you can't pin blame anywhere. Uh, we have these huge mega power structures now uh, that don't give a fig about us. They just want us to buy their stuff or, or send their, our money or they can take our money or, or whatever. And one of those is the medical industry. I mean, people have to stop thinking that this is the nice, gentle doctor uh, in the small town. This is a huge industry that profits from sickness, not from health. So now American people, I don't know how it is in Germany, but in America, People are sicker than they've ever been. And I've watched it happen over the decades. People's health is just going down the tubes and you really see it in the children. Most children have problems and they're on medication. That's mm -hmm. just the fact, not a few, most children in America. So, so well, we have something out of control, but because we are the little guy and we don't, we're not organized, and you know, we believe in our authority figures as we have for thousands of years, uh, everything's uh, turning belly up because it's not working. Mm. The moral nature of society has degenerated greatly. I don't know if it's the, the, uh, Christ the Christian church has, you know, the Catholic church, the Christian churches have uh, not, been attended. I don't know if that counts. Or I, I, I don't know what it is, but I know that organized religion is no longer something that most people seem to want. Mm. And, uh, and in a way, there's a good part of that, where if it were that they were willing now to do for themselves what they used to get from the church, that would be pretty good. But unfortunately, that's not the case doesn't strike me as being the case, at least in America. It's kind of whoopee is sort of what happens here. You don't have the shackles anymore of the have to. So now you do what you want to. And now we're getting a little too close to Aleister Crowley's uh, maxim, which is do as thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that's, that's Satanism. That's not at all what I want. Uh, because, uh, you know, society is a, an important ingredient of earth life, whether you, you admire your society or not, or you agree with its leaders, or it doesn't matter, it, it, the, we need this, we need a human society. Is it enough to just have a neighborhood? No, I don't think so, because we have this communication device now, the computer, the television, we, we're sort of all learning uh, from each other on a world basis now. So it probably isn't going to be enough to think, well, I'll just, let's just go back to the past and have small communities uh, where everybody knows each other and you know you can choose your lead. I don't think it's gonna work because I, 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 I'm haunted by that other maxim which says you can never go back. So if we're going forward, uh, how are we going to do that? And that's, that's where we come into uh, loggerheads 
against the global elites because it looks to me like they've decided that they're tired of waiting for us to uh, pick up the threads of our independence or our ability to think or our ability to govern our lives. And now they're gonna control our lives and they're gonna control it through mind control uh, and, uh, and a medical uh, fascist system that uh, they seem to be calling in America anyway, precision medicine, <laughs> I like that term, precision medicine. What it means is they can fix you remotely because now you have all this nanotech in you and they're gonna make it seem like they're putting the nanotech in you. It's just one little device. That's not true. <laughs> There's all kinds of nanotech in you. Mm -hmm. And so now if they can get the frequency for that and the specs on how to operate it, well then, you know, they'll, they'll be directing you. And if they want you to have a sickness cause they have a, they're not making enough money uh, in uh, March, 2021 well, then they can, uh, they can create a sickness in you, uh, especially if we're, uh, we have this operating system that's called a vaccine coming in mm -hmm. and uh, they, can, they can create what they need in you. Oh, you have, uh, oh my gosh, it's the Spanish flu all over again. Imagine that, or, oh no, it's polio, wow. So um, then they can, uh, bring you in or create a, a regional uh, pandemic of some sort and then you know make a lot of money from that. This is my concern mm. is uh, I do not trust these people yeah. at all. And I don't trust the system. I studied Chinese medicine for six years and I've used it my whole life. I haven't been, I've told you before, I haven't been to a doctor since I was 13. Uh, I've done all self, uh, self-healing with my children that I raised and myself. And, uh, and I, I, don't, uh, I don't trust these organizations at all. Mm. They lie all the time. Uh, they pay doctors to lie. Uh, th there's just, you know, there's all kinds of things that are, are, are untrustworthy. I, I don't think it's that I'm paranoid. So, um, so what shall we do now, now that we're in this jam? Uh, to me, the first thing I would do is learn as much as I can about my situation so that I can make good decisions. And to do that, I'm going to have to step outside uh, the fold. I'm going to have to step outside consensus reality, perhaps even, uh, but certainly step outside the TV. In fact, I recommend everybody take their TV outside, put some, put some goggles on and smash it and get, uh, and then wrap it up and take it down to the uh, dump and be done with it because mm. it's nothing more than a mind control device. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and then you can start to read again. Ooh, imagine that reading. Um, most people in America don't read anymore. So, you know, why do I write these books? Well, I write them for the very few people who really still do read and think. And my hope is that someday there'll be more of those people, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. So um, that, that would be what I would say, that's, that's step number one. It's not a matter of finding the right doctor. It's not a matter of finding the right hospital, the right drug, the right whatever, like along those lines, that's, that's a, a line of non-health that we should abandon, but we shouldn't abandon it without having found another way to go. Uh, see, I have another way to go that's very practiced, works really well, and I do it every day. It's not a matter of taking a pill. I have to uh, sometimes suffer uh, a, a little bit of pain in order to, you know, make sure everything's working. And, uh, and, and it's, a wonderful, it's a wonderful natural lifestyle because I, I believe in a natural human evolution. I'm a student yeah. of Rudolf Steiner. And, you know, I studied Steiner many years ago when I became a Waldorf teacher, a Steiner teacher uh, in my training. And since then, many years later, I've left Waldorf education simply because I burned out uh, and uh, started writing again because I had been a writer before uh, I was a teacher. So, um, to me, uh, 
Steiner's beauty is that he, uh, he sees a meaning in every life, that we have all come here to do something. Uh, and some of us to do mighty, what, what the world would call mighty deeds and other, uh, others in the world would call small deeds. But, but we, have, we have that obligation and we have that, um, that opportunity to further develop ourselves by learning to discern truth from falsehood, uh, disinformation from misinformation, um, a, the what someone is really saying when we're listening to them, we can hear that that in a way there there's something below what they're saying that doesn't quite jive with, with us. Uh, we we develop our sensitivities. Rudolf Steiner says we don't have just five senses; we have twelve, and um, and to operate on all cylinders firing, if I could use a, a machine metaphor, uh, is, is of course what we want while we're here. We wanna spend our time as wisely as possible because we're not here that long. You know, 80, 90 years uh, is not that long uh, to learn all the lessons we have to learn. So um, I'm very thrilled to be here despite all the problems or maybe because of all the problems. I mean, I'm a warrior. And, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very excited about uh, discovering what is true and what isn't true uh, by dint of my own effort, not because uh, I found the great guru who can do all that work for me, uh, mm -hmm. but because I'm developing myself. And that's, that's kind of how I see humanity is we have an evolution we're involved in. And yeah, there's a lot of couch potatoes and a lot of people who who are seem pretty mean-spirited and, and small-minded. Absolutely, that's always in every era. Uh, but um, that, that needn't be our definition of humanity. Uh, the other definition of humanity that people keep uh, making is to think of some of our really uh, psychopathic leaders as being the model of uh, what a human being is and isn't. And uh, no, that's not true at all. Um, the great human beings are the ones that I look at. When I was a kid, I was an only child and um, I had a pretty uh, mm, unstable family life. And so I would uh, retreat into books. And uh, I, I remember setting myself a program when I was about 12, 11 through 13 or so when I decided I would read nothing but biographies and autobiographies of great people. So I developed a list and I would just take one after the other out of the library. And I was a really good reader and a quick reader. And, and I, just, I just went through all those lives just to see how these people did it. How did they, how did they do so much in such a short amount of time? Or, you know, and, and a lot of times what I found is a lot of these people, I think right away of Dostoevsky, uh, a lot of these people um, had a lot of trouble when they were young and got into a lot of trouble. And, and a, a lot of them had a, a long-term illnesses that they had to struggle with uh, as a young person, very hard to be in bed for months and that sort of thing. And I found, wow, they had, they had a lot of struggle. They had a lot of a lot of, uh, of, uh, of things that made them uh, stronger. And, uh, and that, that's, yeah, that sounds right to me that that's part of life. Cause I had a hard life. I mean, you know, I didn't know it was as hard as it was until I was older, but I, I knew it was hard. And, um, and I wanted to be a great soul, a Mahatma, you know, like uh, Gandhi is thought of as a, as a Mahatma. He was a lousy uh, father and uh, parent uh, er, and husband, I think. And he but wasn't he, racist. He was a misogynist. He, yeah, he had, I, I don't exactly. have him on the pedestal. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And yet here was this will driving him to do this one thing for India. I mean, it was you know, it was, it's, it's almost like somebody says to you, look, you can be remembered by history as great, 
but you're going to have to be really awful in these other things. Are you up for it? <laughs> and I don't know what I would say. I'd probably say no. Uh, I wouldn't want to be that awful in those things because for me, for me, it's had to do with self-development. Mm. You know, first of all, I had to get to know myself because I didn't, I didn't really know myself when I was a child, right? And most people don't seem to know themselves all the way through life, actually. But I finally uh, learned who I was through the years. And now I'm completely who I am, uh, I think. And I'm able to call on all those forces of this individual that I am. And that's kind of how I see it is, yeah, we've got these psychopaths, these globalist corporate psychopaths who all they think of is profit, but also they have esoteric, many of them are esotericists and they have big plans for humanity, such as we're all gonna be cyborgs. Mm -hmm. We're all gonna be the transhumanist dream that they have is that we're going to merge with the AI systems and be able to draw the internet before our gaze uh, at will and be a uh, participant in dramas going on in other people's internet scenarios. Uh, and that our entire life will be cybernetic, no feelings, no sexuality to speak of other than you know the, the prime uh, breeders that they have in mind. Mm -hmm. So they have their, uh, their vision for us. This is not for them, mind you. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they feel that you know they have this right because they're from certain bloodlines, they're from certain lineages. And, um, and I'm pitted against them. I'm one of the people pitted against that vision. Not against these people, because I don't, I don't know them personally, so I can't speak for that. I, you know, I have mindset. thoughts. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so uh, to do that, yeah, I could go and, you know, maybe kill a couple of them, which wouldn't do anything. Uh, but mostly I need to develop myself. Mm. Mostly I need to expand my myself and, um, and really live deeply into my time. That's how I see it. And I, I got that from Rudolf Steiner. Mm. It, it, you know, to be able to, uh, to really enter into your time and bring your, the gifts you have to, uh, it, it, you, you may think, oh, well, you're just one person, Elon. It doesn't really matter. You need millions and billions of people. But it doesn't really work that way. It really doesn't work that way. It's more quality than quantity. And they know that. The uh, global elites know that. They know you know, certain people they watch because they know things about their past and maybe past lives and maybe their astrological chart or, or however they do it, however they do it with their tricks and magical ways. Yeah. Um, but to really operate out of one's individuality in this era, not, not previous eras, this is, this is the beginning of learning to be individual. This is what Rudolf Steiner said. And the greatest favor we can do to people, said Rudolf Steiner, regarding being becoming individuals in future generations, despite the machine age, despite the fact that we're in this battle now to keep from becoming cyborgs, is that we recognize evil in our time and can name it and describe it. And that's, that's that's the choice I've made. That's what I do, uh, is to really recognize the evil of our time. And that's why I've written three books on geoengineering, because this is the grand black magic act to control the planet is coming through the geoengineering. Uh, and um, you may balk at the word black magic it has uh, a very exact definition, and it certainly has to do with science and alchemy, uh, and uh, and and that's what we're able to see. What happened to Texas recently mm -hmm. was as just just as good as black magic.
yeah. because the technology was used against it and those who used it knew exactly what they were doing and, uh, and have uh, full, full power over that now that this, um, this faux president is in office. Mm. Uh, and so uh, I, um, I'll stop there and let Judith guide me because you know I, I wanted to say all of that of a piece and, and I can certainly address um, separate questions mm -hmm. uh, yeah. if you have them, Judith. Yeah, you know, sometimes I have these odd moments. I'm doing something very, very mundane, like, like let's say vacuum cleaning or doing the dishes. And then out of the blue, a thought hits me. <laughs> yes. And it, exactly. it's not that I'm striving for it. It's just poof, yes. there. And um, the other day I had this... Uh, experience and all of a sudden I thought you know the Georgia Guidestones there is um, one commandment where it says unite humanity under one living language and during my vacuum cleaning I thought yeah that's the hive mind that that's that's not really a language like English, German, Arabic, whatever. What do you think? Well, I think you're right, uh, except that they could use English or, you know, English now is the, the one language that, you know, it, they use at meetings and sorts of things. Uh, the question I have would be uh, when the Georgia Guidestone, and I read that years ago, uh, when it says it, is it just to keep the people's minds in that particular uh, format. Mm -hmm. Because every language, I mean, we have lost so many languages, thousands of languages, because we've lost thousands of separate groups of people as they've whittled us down, down, down to collective, collective, collective. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I started life out speaking Romanian. You probably started life out thinking German. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, Romanian is, is different from English as you can possibly imagine. It's very much a romance language. It's very much based almost entirely in Latin. And, um, and so when I, when I later studied Latin in school, it was like I already knew it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was very easy for me. That, but the, to compare the the languages with English, I mean, a lot of people who've had to learn like English as a second language have felt it's very harsh and not, uh, not soft, not, uh, not this or that from their native tongue. And so if you make everybody speak one language in the world, mm -hmm. you're really controlling the mind, the brain. You're really controlling the brain. And that, that's what I thought when I read that from the Georgia Guidestones. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a lot of people that can't wait for the bionic eyes, ears, legs, or what have you. Personally, I think that this entire scenario with, oh, we can live forever, we upload your consciousness into a machine, that will not work. I do not believe that it's possible to uh, store that consciousness in a machine. And I would be a little bit cautious here because I'm pretty sure all these so-called benefits with the bionic ear, eye, whatever, and uh, the nanobots that repair you from inside and no longer <laughs> needed to go to a surgery, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have a strong feeling that is for a select few and it will not be not even be offered to the peasants. No, I think you're right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, these people who think that this bionic vision of our bodies sounds fascinating and wonderful, um, obviously don't understand how fascinating and wonderful a real human being is 
and a real human body. I mean, I'm, I'm learning a lot about the body because I have to read so much about synthetic biology. And, um, and this body is, uh, is absolutely extraordinary. It's, uh, it, it's what's happening is the transhumanist dream is to turn us into machines, period. Mm -hmm. There is no other reason. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can get a, a Titanic, uh, a, 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 you know, you can get a, a, a hip, you can get a, an eye, you can get a this or that and become semi-cybernetic, like a hybrid. You would, you would then be called a hybrid. Uh, or you can uh, be built and constructed Excuse from me, the bottom second. up. So that means at that point, you are no longer a real human. You're a well, hybrid. in a sense, no. Mm -hmm. In a sense, no, because now you have that particular device and you think it's just a device. You don't understand what's in that device. First of all, there's a whole nanotechnology uh, swarm in that device. And when I say swarm, I'm talking about a state of consciousness that nanotechnology has. This is the, the absolutely ex uh, horrifying, actually, uh, in a way, uh, part of nanotechnology that most people don't know about, uh, they haven't been taught about it, is that it has its own consciousness. And that consciousness is, um, the best word is swarm or the hive mind. That is the hive mind. And the hive mind is the nanotech that lives in us. And it can be, because it's been engineered, bioengineered, it can therefore uh, be run outside because it has very tiny microprocessors in it, little tiny computers. Not all of them, not all of the nanobots. Uh, some of the nanotechnology is just, uh, they're just like uh, grunts in an, in an army. They're not the ones with the brains. They do what they're told. And, uh, and then there are those that are the actual nanorobots, nanobots uh, that are in touch with uh, what I call the laptop boys in, you know, sitting in Denver or uh, the satellites above the AIs that are in satellites above us, uh, uh, that, that we will be run by these systems because these systems will eventually replace our own real blood vessels, just as they're gonna take, you know, they take somebody's uh, hip out, the hip bone out that is not working and put in uh, a, another uh, metallic one. Uh, in that way, we will eventually be replaced. And because we're the common people, we're the ones that they want to, uh, to do the experiments on, not the elites who you know, have their own devices. They have their own devices. And the one, the one device I thought was very like what I think they have is that one in the movie Elysium yeah. with Matt Damon. Yeah. I think they all have one of those and, uh, and they are able to use it uh, for maintaining their health. They, they are breathing the same atmosphere as us to a degree, but they rarely come into our, uh, where we are. So they're not breathing the heavy metals. And if they are breathing them, they can easily uh, have them detoxed because they have their own, they live a, an extremely different life from how we live. And so uh, the idea that we are going to be destroyed by them, uh, I don't see that, you know, en masse. I don't see it. I, I think it would be the easiest thing in the world for them to do, but I think we're entirely too de too valuable as uh, as uh, guinea pigs to experiment on. So when people say things like that about how wonderful it's going to be, these are TV people. Mm -hmm. I don't talk to TV people. Yeah, I don't have anything to say. First of all, I don't even know what's on TV, mm -hmm. and I certainly don't listen to NBC, ABC, CBS. You know all the liars. Uh, because I, um, I have a lot of good sources now of real thinking people, a real democratic movement going on that is called by mainstream media false news, but is really the real news. So you see, we have this inversion going on. Everything they're saying, it's almost the opposite is true. So, you know, it's great to hear them say it and then you can go, okay, so they said that, so I'll think the opposite. Uh, and that's, that's kind of where we're at now in this bizarre moment of so-called civilization. I mean, it's bizarre.
Mm. Absolutely bizarre. If you feel like it's bizarre, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I uh, constantly have the feeling I'm in an open air madhouse. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, very good. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you tell people that say, yeah, but look, we are already using hot pacers. Well, I, 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 you know, I can't, I can't judge that because um, we, we haven't, I think the new thought form is, is now here where we have the opportunity to think, what is this technology that is being uh, put into our bodies, like this vaccine? Uh, it's obviously not just another vaccine. It's a technology. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of people won't hear that because they've got their TVs on. And, and it may actually be that um, that's how things are to go now, is this grand split in humanity. This, that may be happening. Certainly, Rudolf Steiner um, prophesied that it would one day come. I think he thought it would be, hoped it would be much later. But it might be now. Might be that there are the people who love the machines and go toward the machine and become a machine. And then there are the people who don't trust the machine, who don't necessarily, they're not Luddites, they're not like throwing machines out and burning them up. But on the other hand, they're not comfortable with the machines running our lives. And so they go another way. And and it may, it, that may be the what's going on right now. I mean, I. I can't believe I'm so fortunate as to live in a time of massive change in humanity, but I may be living in such a time. I'm certainly paying very close attention to what's going on because uh, it will have to do not just with my future now here, but with a future of another time. And, and I pay very close attention because of that. Uh, and I, I, can, I certainly have no desire or, or fantasy that I can save any of humanity. But what I can do is remind, just like Socrates did, remind people of what they once knew. That's what all knowledge is, said Socrates. It's just memory of what you once knew. In another time, as another person, in another people, and that's kind of how I feel what my task is. Uh, and um, I certainly want to encourage people to have their own life because the people who are saying, wow, great, I'm gonna get a titanium uh, knee or whatever, and I wanna be a machine and I wanna live forever. Those are not my people. Those are somebody else's people or something else's people. And, uh, and I, I don't want to stop them or deter them in any way. I want them to have that free choice mm. to take the path they take. And, and I smell a deep... I go. Sorry, huh? Sorry. I, I smell a deep-rooted fear of death in all of this. Well, everyone always has... It seems like most people have a fear of death. Mm. I certainly don't because... I died once in a wave. I may have told you about that, Judith, when I was 22. I died and, and I got, got a, a look at how great it is, uh, you know, down that long tunnel. Uh, and uh, I have no fear. But I think, um, I think if you continue to watch television, you will, it's a big mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think if people could just do that one thing, uh, an entire false reality would collapse. And they would begin to have their own thoughts mm -hmm. and their own fantasies and their own insights. And if we combine it with throwing away the smartphones, oh, that would be swell. That would be very good. I know they're convenient. See, I don't have the habit, so... I, I'm going entirely on hearsay. I have a landline that is just inert. I haven't bonded with it particularly. I don't take it to bed with me. 
Mm. I don't uh, cuddle it and check it every 45 seconds or whatever that, <laughs> is, that people do. Um, I, uh, I use it for, for business and um, I have my own thoughts. I have my books. I have a lot to do. It's not like I'm bored. I was thinking the other night as I'm looking out at this apartment complex I live in, that most people in this apartment complex in the evening, they're watching television. I mean, you know, it's like, I should have realized that two years ago, right? When I moved in, but it just suddenly occurred to me, wow. Yeah. How strange. Everybody. Yeah, everybody. And it's like sadder than sad mm. because I've never ever had that habit. Yeah. Not even in my childhood, I was raised without TV. You know, I remember the black and white TV was so awful. <laughs> you could hardly see anything well. So why spend the time? And so I read a lot. And, uh, you know, here I am, a full, a full on real human being. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also with the smartphones, you know, a lot of the control grid is hinging on that with the immunity, uh, immunity passports and you know, uh, tracking you and blah, 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 blah. So if we really wanted, we could put a huge fork into the road. Yes. Oh, yes. And it would collapse overnight. But I love myself. <laughs> yeah, you love your prison cell. I get it. Exactly. Continue play. Exactly. <laughs> It's the perfect word, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it is, uh, it's, it's one of the big lessons of this era. Hmm. And it's, uh, it, it, it'll go hard with some people, it'll go yeah. hard. I had yesterday an interview with um, uh, Wayne McRoy and we talked oh, about- Oh, I like Wayne. I've read his book uh, on yeah. autism. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. And he, uh, we talked a little bit about the different yugas, the time cycles that yeah. we are going through. And according to that model in the Kali Yuga, people are totally focused on the outside world and there is no life going on inside. You know what I mean? And when I look at that, you know, yeah. It's true. It's it is. Funny. And you know, it's a mystery to me, Judith, because Rudolf Steiner says that the Kali Yuga ended in 1899. Mm -hmm. And we're in, a, um, we're in a transition phase now. And so I keep hearing that the Kali Yuga is continuing. And I, I think, was Steiner wrong? Or, uh, or are we looking too narrowly at this? So I, I, I read a couple of... Um teachers and some say um, we are at the ascending um, part of the Kali Yuga, meaning we are slowly moving out of it. And others say, you know, it also depends on your own perception, what you think and how you feel where, where you are living. But to me, I have to say, to me, that really feels like Kali Yoga. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I mean, not that, you know, I'm going to change anything because of that. But I, for me, it has ended. And, uh, and this is, this, this thing going on now is completely generated from a satanic uh, phalanx yeah. of uh, elites. And they have tremendous power because they have these terrible bloodlines that they've sacrificed so many children for. Uh, that uh, I feel that um, that's why it's important to uh, unravel the evil. That would be what I'd call this era I'm living in is, is where the evil is now through what uh, Michael Hoffman calls the revelation of the method, you can see it. You can now see it if you so choose to look. And that's, of course, I've spent my, my whole adult life, possibly uh, at least 40 years, 
um, studying and writing about this evil that I uh, have uh, discovered. And, um, and I, uh, I think that, yeah, I like that idea of the Kali Yuga on the upswing because maybe that's it, is there's an, there's an overlap. I mean, other people though, Judith, are telling me it's the uh, age of Aquarius. This is not the age of Aquarius. The age of Aquarius will not come for another, I don't know, one or 200 years, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Anyway. That, and, and, I know there are very, very different points of views there. Yeah, but how could you have Kali Yuga still going on and it's the age of Aquarius? Yeah, Aquarius is sense. ruled by Saturn, you know, and Saturn has a lot to do with restriction and with... Um, yeah, control and it's very authoritative. And so I, I don't know why the hippies were so beside themselves of the coming of uh, the age of Aquarius because it really, really has some, yeah, difficulties. Yeah, not only difficulties, it's harsh. Well, and I think that it's... Uh it's that some people don't realize there's a man behind the curtain. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I am super aware that a man is behind the curtain. And it's like the, the Christians that I encounter now and then uh, who tell me that this is the end time. You know, the man behind the curtain can use that. The man behind the curtain knows about that idea and mm -hmm. can use it and exploit it. Just like it, you can exploit the Kali Yuga, just like it can exploit the Aquarian era. If you don't know about the man behind the curtain, that's the first thing you should be concentrating on mm. is how they're using that because they use our belief systems behind us all the time. So anyway, that's what I've chosen to do. I don't make any grand statements about Kali Yuga and uh, Aquarian age or anything. Uh, it's all sort of tangential to me. It's not really important I, anyway, because I'm, I'm so immersed in my time as I try to find out the components that are, are using the puppet show here mm. so that we can see through that to our own lives. That's, that's what I concentrate on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I like to go down very various avenues. <laughs> I know you do. I know you do. That's, and that's good. That's you. That's different from me. Mm. And I'm pretty much the, you know, this, I stay on a track until finally, the little voice inside says, good job, you're done now. <laughs> and then I can move on to something else I'm interested in. That's what I'm gonna do when this book is done. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, great. So would you say you are silently optimistic that we can, yeah, turn this around? Turn this around, turn what around? Um, the possibility that we all turn into machines and that there will not be one shred of freedom left. No, I think there will always be something of freedom left because I'm, I'm now convinced that, uh, that we're separating, that the, the human race is separating. But we and will share the same world? Sure. Sure. And how do we do that? Well, I'm, I'm, I can envision, uh, you know, little enclaves okay. off over here and, you know, and, and then maybe there's a law against that. And, you know, then there's a battle and I can envision all kinds of things going on uh, around the controllers wanting us all to be hive mind. Mm. Right. And then you've got people who aren't hive mind. So what do you do about that? Well, you kill off a bunch that are a, a problem at, at the time, but you can't kill them all. So maybe they'll find another way to do it. Uh, I don't know, but I'm sort of, the way I look at it is, I believe there is a divine world mm -hmm. and that the divine world is in charge, period. There is no ifs, ands, or buts. But the problem is for us here, little tiny people that we are with our little tiny consciousness and our fears and our anxieties and all that is that we don't know 
because we are free will beings, because we, you know, I, and I know I've said to you before, Steiner said that uh, humanity is the religion of the gods mm. because we are free will beings and not even the angels are free will beings. Um, and they will not interfere with our free will. The spiritual world will not interfere. But if the planet is jeopardized, and now we're in the realm of geoengineering because they could easily jeopardize this planet, period, with a few couple of acts, no problem, uh, then um, that will not be allowed, not be allowed at all. And that will be the end of it, rather like what Atlantis probably went through. Mm -hmm. Atlantis was also a technological error. Oh, yeah. And, uh, and so, I have that as a backdrop and a and and a relief that that takes the the terrible burden off my shoulders. Now, uh, what we have to deal with is a, a real human affair here, and our relationship with our institutions, for one thing, our relationship with nation states, for another, uh, and you know. Meanwhile, we have the invisible masters, the global elites, who's you know, we will, we will never really see them, uh, but we will feel the brunt of their actions through their, their puppets like Bill Gates. So um, we have to figure this out. And as we figure it out, it's like you having your thought at the kitchen sink. Uh, we, we are, that's where our thoughts really, our thoughts come from a scalar level. They are not physical. They're, the brain is not producing the thoughts. No, no. You're simply diving off of your brain in order to have these scalar events. And those scalar events are tied to the quantum uh, level of reality. And so uh, by having, by pulling your thoughts up into something where you're really doing some work and not just uh, down here scrabbling and having feelings and emotions and fears and all that, uh, where you're you're, you, now you're engaged in the spiritual world itself. That's, that's what thinking really is. Um, not abstract thinking necessarily where, you know, you're thinking of maybe a math problem, but, um, but where the great thoughts are, th this is a different realm and you have access to that if you so choose, but you have to have a very strong will in order to do that kind of work and in order to penetrate. Rudolf Steiner, if, I, if it seems like I'm too much with Rudolf Steiner, the guy saved my, in, I was very much an intellectual, but that's not what I'm talking about. He was able to show me how I could develop my thinking to a much greater level than I was doing it in academia where I did very well. So for me, um, this, is, this is the key. And, uh, and being able to function uh, from that level, um, you know, this will not end. This, this, we will, we will keep going. There is no question. We will keep going. I am not afraid in the least of that. Mm -hmm. So uh, to me, that's all I care about. If I can be in the field of action, I'm a happy, a happy soldier uh, because I'm here to represent humanity at its best. That's all I want to represent. Mm. Yeah. That was a very nice close, closing. So good. The famous last words. <laughs> 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 oh, what am I doing here? My goodness. Well, it must be pretty late there, Judith. Yeah, it is. But uh, still, you know, I should be able to operate this. <laughs> The machine. <laughs> yeah, but this uh, paid version um, of Zoom, it has some, it's, it's minor, but it has some other features. And, you know, when you use one thing for a really long time and you do it almost blind, you yeah. know, and then out of the blue, you know, what? <laughs> Well, and that's sometimes good because at least you're 
a little bit of awake and not not just sleeping through it like with the thing you're very good at yeah. um but anyway that was that was fun thank you so much yeah are we done, are we, done? we are done i i <laughs> i promised you i promised you not a good hour and i think we are over that that's all right that's all right it's, it's all been right. a long time i'm glad to see you I'm glad to see you're doing well other than your pinky toe yeah <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it will get better. No problem. <laughs> All right. And, and the book will be out in, uh, yeah. well, I, April is what I'm aiming for. But because I'm doing it myself, I have to handle all these other things. And meanwhile, I'm trying to concentrate on writing. So we'll yeah. see. But it, I, I, won't, uh, I, I won't shirk my duty to do a, a good, as good a representation as I can. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It'll probably be the biggest book I've done yet. Yeah, and the others are whoppers as, as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I said something stupid months ago where I said, oh, there probably won't be that many footnotes. Oh, that's so not true. <laughs> that is so not true. <laughs> what was I thinking? Yeah. I, I know when I bought uh, Gary Wayne's book, um <laughs> that book has what book is that um the genesis 6 conspiracy how secret oh societies uh, oh my gosh uh, try yeah, to insert uh, humankind so um and when i uh opened opened that book and then at the end i noticed that the footnotes in that book alone are to, between 200 and 300 pages. <laughs> yeah. Only for months. Wow. <laughs> no, I don't think it's, I'm that bad. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. All right, Judith, I'm going to go. Okay, Elana, all the best uh, for the book and for the last chapter. So this was it, Night Flight for today with the wonderful Elana Freeland. Stay safe and sound out there. And until next time, bye-bye.